for it. Instead, he's taken his wheel. Now he's starting to go through. Both riders are at the limit, it seems to me, here. Because this race has gone so quick today, it's averaging in excess of 42 kilometers an hour. But at times, we've seen speeds recorded on the flat roads of up to 57 kilometers an hour. It won't be the fastest race. The record holder, by the way, is Peter Post, team manager of the Novo My team. And that won't be beaten today. 45 kilometers an hour, that was. Uh, 27 miles an hour and that day the wind was helping them all the way to the finish let's have a look down the road from the helicopter the helicopter pilot has the best seat in Padre Bay that's for sure 45 seconds to the gap as we again dip over the main auto route the freeway that runs between Paris, Lille and Brussels not to be recommended Olaf Ludwig, who's brought a new lease of life to the German telecom team this year. A team that struggled to gain recognition, but now they've got Olaf Ludwig on the squad. Well, he really is the man to win them the classics. Van Hoyerdonk, there he is having his lunch. Gilbert Duclos Lazelle, last year's winner, must have been incredibly pleased with his ride so far today. You can see the holes in his shorts because of the crash he had at the start of the cobbles cup. This looks like Dirk de Wolf coming up. It is Marc Sergent, Massimo Girotto, 31 kilometers to go at Louville. Sean Yates, his face blackened by the dust, but still very much in the thick of this action. Benjamin Van Itterbeek is there. And that was Hendrik Verdant, Van Itterbeek's more illustrious teammate, who's also tapped on. He's come right through the field. That's been a great chase by Verdant. Oh, there are still messengers coming across from the remnants of the main field. Whether they spent too much effort to bridge the gap, they've been chasing for something like 90 minutes or more to get across to this league group. Yeah, very difficult ride indeed, but that was the rider when Mark Madio won, who so nearly won, because he punctured when he was in the lead by 30 seconds with something like uh, 10 kilometers to go. And Madio was the first rider to sail past him and went on to victory. You won't forget that. Still at the Belgian-Dutch tandem of Berman Cizon. No wins for him last year at all. And Adrie van der Poel. Still only a few seconds in it. Well, the only stage win for van der Poel last year that I can recall was the second stage of the Kellogg's Tour of Britain. That was a photo finish, but he got it and uh, he finished second overall in the race, rather, as well. But these two seem to settle down nicely now. Van der Poel anxious to work with him. Remember, as this race approaches the finish, there are about 32 kilometers to go, about 20 miles. They're going to gain in confidence as we look down the road to see if the gap is very much there, and indeed it is. And there's a lot of work to be done now. This is a superb move. Van der Poel may have at last read this one correctly. As he's gone clear, he's caught Hermann Fries on Ludwig, who has no friends in that chase group. He's the only rider from Telecom. Seems to be left to do a lot of work. I'm surprised here that the GB team, and Ludwig's had enough, he's swung off. In fact, it wasn't Ludwig, but a teammate that uh, was setting the pace at the front. Because that rider who's come up now is Rolf Aldag, so he came across with that group that contained Redant. And so, in fact, Ludwig does have a teammate up here. And there's the speed at the moment, just short of 50 kilometers an hour, some 30 miles an hour. Dirk the Wolf won the A's Bast on the A's last year on the left of our picture, just peeping in in the Gatorade colours. Gianni Bunyo, by the way, not here today. And a look over his shoulder. Van der Poel must be feeling very pleased with what he sees down the road. Not a lot, just the cars. That's a good sign. The commissaires have let in plenty of following cars. Now the gap is growing. 
And judging by the speed of the leaders, very much on a par with that chase group. If anything, they might be going further ahead. And Rolf Aldov driving along. Not thinking of victory for himself, but knowing that if he can bring back these two leaders, he could well be handing victory to his team leader, Olaf Ludwig. Ludwig only in his fourth season as a professional. And there's the gap, 28 seconds. It's looking extremely promising now. Time is running out for the chase group. I'm surprised that Museo is allowing so much lead here because they still have some trump cards in that chase group. They could play the double. They've got Ballerini and Museo. One for the sprint, one for the long attack. Ballerini seemingly riding on the form he had two years ago. He had a rather poor season last year with no victories at all. But the previous year, he finished fifth in Paris-Roubaix, third in the Tour of Lombardy, won a stage in the Tour of Italy, eighth in the Tour of Flanders, and finally rounded it up 12th in the World Cup. In the World Championship, rather. C swang 1,500 metres. Sector 5A. That means we've got a double sector here. We'll be on 5B shortly after we go through a small stretch of tarmac road. Well, if nothing else, uh, Adri van der Poel will continue to build his rather convincing lead in the cobblestone competition. The first three riders score points. And Rolf Aldag is doing a terrific job here as a faithful domestic. play now that nobody else is going to get up to these leaders anybody that missed the express train that took off at Valenciennes heading for the forest of Arlenberg I think apart from Duke Lozelle and that small group that since joined have now missed the boat and it looks as though Van der Poel is riding a little bit too well over these cobblestones he's causing some pain now to Frison no, Frison was dropping back, I think, so he could see the stones himself and watch out for the big holes that occasionally appear between them. You've got to ride your own race over the cobbles. You can't follow the wheel of the man in front. Superb piece of riding here by Aldag. And Johan Museu is quite clearly saying thank you very much. Sitting there in the slipstream. He's over to the far right of the picture now. Well, the crowd has found this bend of one of the key bends. Many of them having transferred from the forest by car. Sometimes a problem to get through the traffic jams, but they're here anyway. 16 seconds, so this fine riding by Aldag is now causing the gap to close down. And just look how the brake also is spread eagle now by the fine pacemaking. Oh, and it's Ballerini who's causing the pain. Duclo is out trying to grab his wheel. Franco Ballerini, it had to come from the MGGB boys. It had to. Because one's the stair, that's the man who would go for the long one, and that's Ballerini. Museo is the one they'd save for the sprinter. Ballerini is gone, and Duclo Lozella has read it well. Where does this old man of French cycling find it from? fought all day to join the leaders. He's up there and now he's determined. It can only be because he's last year's winner. He's inspired beyond belief. Last year's winner racing on French soil. Well, not quite soil either. Stones. But Ballerini has been riding so well this year. And just look at this. right up to our camera. Oh, he's coming right up to the two leaders. My goodness me, he's on them. He's gone straight by them. And so too has Duclo Lazelle and Van der Poel has realised it. Please on wants to know if there's any more coming and there isn't. This is a superb move now. And I think that Van der Poel can't get on the train. Ballerini is still content to make the running. Duclo Lazelle is going with him. Well, we're approximately 19 miles from the finish here. It's still a long way to go, but this has gone so quickly off the group. And 
one has to ask, is it the adrenaline that has caused Duplo Lazelle to catch the wheel of Ballerini? Because surely this man hasn't got the legs today. The French said he was their favourites, but I thought that was just a little bit of nepotism. There we saw 25 kilometres to go, so it's just over 15 miles from the finish. A little signal there from Ballerini, and I think it was to call Duplo Lazelle through, but he's not going. 15 miles from the finish. Crucial point to put home the attack. They split that chase group up behind. Van der Poel has gone back, so too has Fison. I don't know if our French cameras now, because they're going to be a little bit excited by this break, will show us the chase that they have from the helicopter, and there it is. It's reduced to four men. Van der Poel is still in there. Looking down, I'm afraid to say that Sean Yates is gone. I'm sorry about that, because Sean is such a good bike rider. Deserves a result in this race. So they might bring these back. We could have six leaders very shortly. Now, a chance to see the sloping top tube there on Franco Ballerini's frame. Now, that frame was specially made, sprayed and built only 24 hours before the start at Perry Bay because Ballerini decided to try out one of these soft ride suspensions, uh, extensions rather, on the bike. And because he altered his riding position and made his handlebars too high, he foamed Milan and he had a bike made with a sloping top tube so he would reform in the position which he always rides in. And that machine only arrived 24 hours before the start of Perry Bay. So he's getting a softer ride over the cobbles than most. But of course, Duplo Lozelle has the same forks on, although they're slightly lighter this year than the ones he used last year to victory. And, of course, after Duplo Lozelle won last year using suspension type of front forks, you can imagine this year half the field seems to be riding them. So, just as triathlons accelerated the use of those triathlon-shaped handlebars, which Greg LeMond rode to victory in the Tour de France a few years back, so the mountain bike scene now producing for the road bike scene the suspension on the forks and the handlebar extension. Well, the sport isn't afraid to learn, that's for sure. They might learn a lesson here from two riders who've attacked, Ballerini and Duclos Lazelle. The rider in third position is Museo. He certainly will offer nothing in the chase down. Van Hoyerdonk is going to be the rider who'll miss out if he's not careful. He's setting the pace at the right, far right of our picture. And surely Van der Poel here at the back hasn't got much left in those legs now. He's been attacking at every opportunity, and he was right there. He had the chance to go with this group. His legs wouldn't respond when they went by him. The empty roads as we go back up to the leaders. I'm just wondering if Duclos Lozelle has done everything to get into this lead group and he's got nothing left and Ballerini should be assessing this now. Ballerini remains the favourite to win it, this group doesn't come. Ludwig is there, trying to give a helping hand to Edwig van Hooydonk. Failed to win the Tour of Flanders for a third time this year. Instead, that went to Johan Museo in the sprint finish from Franz Massen, van Hooydonk's teammate. resplendent in spring sunshine as the Paris Bay comes down to its final stages. Two riders now have thrown down the gauntlet. The sectors of the cobblestones coming to an end now. Just four stretches left to go. They're not too long, but they are bad. This one at Vanaheim is only 700 metres. There's the chase group with Big Museo, Van Hoedong and the pole. Two Belgians, a German, and a Dutchman chasing down an Italian and a Frenchman. And you can't get much more international than that. Van de Poel, who scored well so far, doesn't seem to be in the points this time. The first three riders out of the cobble section get the points. There are two in the lead, of course. And the big
big lanky figure there of Van Hooydonk, who's going to have to do something and do it quickly if he's going to give Jan Ross the classic victory for the new World Perfect team. Turned professional at the end of the 1986 season, Van Hooydonk, and he popped in with a fifth place in Paris-Roubaix, and everybody said after that he would win. Came back to Paris-Roubaix in 89 and finished third. And he was third again in 1990. He's always ridden well in this race, and now here he is again in at the kill once more. Dust being kicked up by the motor cars and the motorbikes is most unpleasant uh, for the eyes of the riders. But at least it could be worse because these are spring conditions, not the mud we've become accustomed to over the many years of Barry Bay. In fact, many of the journalists at the start this morning were almost on their knees praying for rain. They wanted a tough race. And they couldn't have seen a much better one. There's no lucky winner of this race today, with the favourites all coming to the fore and showing us just why they have been nominated as race favourites for Fairy Bay. They've all ridden a splendid race. They've given everything. Cipollini, sadly, taken out by bad luck. He's now retired, by the way. That's the latest information. He's climbed off. So too has Greg Lamond. So too has Sean Kelly. Museo sitting at the back, he's in such a strong position now. His teammates up front, his company, his teammate can take care of Duclo Lazelle. He's sitting at the back of the chase group, but these four catch up with the front two. Museo will be equally confident he can finish this race off in the spin. The life is rosy now for the Italian team, despite the loss of Cipollini earlier. At one stage today, they had seven of their eight men up in this front group. It does appear that Van der Poel has had it. He's now dreaming of the showers at Roubaix, which is the most welcome sight to these riders. 20 seconds. It's still not a winning gap by any means. But Duclo Lozal has found the legs from summer. He's digging deep. He's starting to work. Oh, the little Frenchman, again risen to the occasion for his new sponsors this year, Gon or Gan, the assurance company. And hopefully he can repeat his feat of a year ago, but he must feel sure that the odds are against that. This is a nasty stretch of cobbles now. Twelve miles to go. Again, Duclos Lozal has projected himself into the front group. His long career, the Frenchman has won 62 races. The 63rd would make him feel rather pleased. Still around about 20 seconds, but they're not getting any closer, that's for sure. Probably hear the, the bikes bouncing over the cobblestones here. Forks taking the full force of the shock on the front of Duclos' bike, while the extension is doing likewise on the machine of Ballerini. Duclos, one of those lovely men of world cycling, thought his career was over back in 19. 84, I think it was, when he literally shot himself in the hand while out hunting. He thought that would be the end of his career, but he came back. I remember him winning his first Paris-Roubaix, no, his first Paris-Nice, rather, back in 1980, that stage race that runs down from Paris to Nice in the springtime in early March. He won it for the first time in the time trial of the Col Des, and he rushed back into the press room to watch it on television. He cheered himself along as he watched himself ride to victory on a recording. Marvellous character, very, very popular with the French. He's not a great climber, yet he's led the King of the Mountains competition in the Tour de France. He arrived at his hometown of Pau, down on the edge of the Pyrenees, wearing the leader's polka dot jersey. And the crowd cheered him all the way, and he laughed because he knew once the big mountains come, he would lose that lead. But all of this has endeared him to the heart of the French crowd. Second place would do them today. They've seen him win the race a year ago after two second places before that. And now he's just 10 miles from the finish. 
can he hold off the race behind? Ballerini is the man dictating the pace, the man on form. And he, he is, to say the least, confident today. He's not even looking for any help from Gilbert Zucco Rizal. And the gap has opened, all thanks to the pacemaking here at Ballerini. 44 seconds. I'm pretty certain that Van der Poel is shot at the back. Here he is. But maybe not so Ludwig or Van Hoyerdonk. But how long can they gamble here? They'll be very worried about the presence of Museo because they know his finish is better than the both put together. And I wonder what Museo is thinking as well, because he really wanted to win Paris Roubaix. He's handicapped now, he can't chase down these two leaders with his teammate up there. I think one of the greatest sounds in the world there are two. There's the finish of the Tour de France on the Champs Elysees, which must be absolutely wonderful to the riders who finally make those sacred cobblestones. And then there are the other sacred cobblestones of Paris Roubaix. When you come into the stadium and the crowd give their roar of approval. Two sectors left, just four kilometers, two and a half miles. Pave left. It's all very, very possible now. Ballerini knows it. Surprisingly, we haven't seen his team manager come up at all. Neither the team manager of Roger Leger because the gap has not grown to one minute. And the rules say until it is one minute, we won't see the team cars of these two riders up behind them. And I bet you Leger and Lefebvre would love to just say something now to these two riders. Even if it's only a word of encouragement, like, I think you can do it. Capo de Larbre. Cobblestones are running out. And it's on the next left-hand bend coming up where Jonathan Bowyer once made a spectacular crash and flew off into the ditch. Jonathan Bowyer. And it was just there where John just went sailing off and out of our camera to the left. I bet you Jonathan's watching the pictures today and thinking, yes, and it hurt as well. The riders today choosing the right-hand side. No puddles, no holes, just a nice little bit of rough grassland without the grass. Ballerini, so confident he couldn't give any care at all as to the location of Duclo Lazal. But why doesn't he attack him? Why doesn't he coax him through and jump in? Sorry about the picture breakup, but I'm sure you want to stay with these pictures. They're magnificent. There's a gap opening. Ballerini is turning the screw now, and Duclo Lazal is going to have to find something special. I'd love to see the face of Lazal, but the new rules following bicycle races for television is we can't go too close, although our cameraman can't resist the shot. He's gone right up alongside him, and there's the face of Duclo Lazal. His hair is hardly out of place, he's just sitting there, he's concentrating on the back wheel of Ballerini. He knows if I can just hold for a few more yards, these cobblestones will be behind us. And you know, if Ballerini doesn't dump Lazelle quickly, he gets onto the smooth roads, he won't drop him. But Ballerini must feel his best condition ever today because he's not trying to get rid of Duclo Lazelle. A minute and three seconds. This surely now is the winning move. Except Duclo won't be watching television right now. He won't know the gap is 63 seconds and nobody can tell him just yet because the roads are too narrow. And I wonder if Ballerini would understand French as well. He's riding with so much confidence, Ballerini. He feels he's got this race won today, that's for sure. And he might have. See the holes there more clearly now on the shorts of Gilbert de Brozal, who went down with a bang when he punctured near Trois-Ville on the first sector of cobbles. He spent the next hour trying to get back into this race. <laughs> Is he back into it now? He's gone with the big attack of the day. Well, this is the 15th time that Duclos Lazal has headed towards Roubaix. And it will have hurt certainly as much as any of the others, if not more.
But the gap continues to go up. A minute and 11 seconds now, and Ballerini has failed to shake off the Frenchman on the cobbled roads, and I doubt very much he'll be able to do it on the smooth ones. And still, Duclos slips it up a gear, but doesn't offer to contribute to any of the pace. And Paddy Roubaix has lost none of his popularity over the years. If anything, there are more people watching this race today than for a long time. <laughs>